differences of action. So they require a choice to be made and they require an action to be taken. Until 30 years ago, the only reference I had ever had of the kingdom of God was the idea of life in heaven after I die. Um, or after Jesus returns to the earth. Those were the two paradigms that I had for the kingdom of God. There has been a significant paradigm shift in the thinking of the church throughout the whole earth since the rebirth and the establishment of Israel as a nation in 1948. We will see that there are certain dates that have been significant in the development and release of certain revelation back to the church. One of those dates is 1948 and the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. Because for 1800, 1900 years, there was no nation and replacement theology had permeated most of the church. And as a result of that, our eschatological point of view in regards to the prophecies and what was being spoken about uh, rejected its Hebraic roots and rejected much of the Old Testament and uh, embraced uh, what I call replacement theology. Now, uh, I want to take a moment uh, today. <coughs> today, the gospel of the kingdom of God uh, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This is Matthew twenty four fourteen. Uh, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples come to him, and in in verse three they say. When will these things happen and what will be the signs of your returning? In the discussion with Jesus, they understood he was going to go away and he was going to come back. They understood that. Now, he says, and in Matthew 24, 14, he, after explaining several situations that would occur, then he says this gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world are in every sphere of the world, in every aspect of the world, as a witness to all the nations or the ethnos. The word nations here is the word ethnos, to all ethnic, tribal, language, people groups. The world here, preached in all the world, is talking about the world's system, the world's philosophies, the world's manner of doing business, for example. And a witness to all the nations means to all the peoples, the languages, and then the end will come. And so we go through this and we, the promise of Matthew 24, 14 is being, has been examined or is being examined and reevaluated by many Christian leaders and people around the world. What does this mean? That's the question. The so what? What, what does this mean? How do I apply this? And there is a growing understanding uh, that there is a potential for a partial revelation of the kingdom of God being manifested through our lives in each and of these ten uh, areas of human society. We go down through here in the area of law, speaking of government and politics, in the area of economics, banking and investment, business, profession and development, Agriculture, commerce and shipping, education, teaching and research, recreation, sports, entertainment, medicine, ecology and drug research, science, technology, invention, psychology, counseling and mental aid, religion, speaking of philosophy and social action. Now, this will be accomplished as a testimony and a foretaste of the way life will be upon the planet when Jesus returns to reign and rule upon the planet. Okay, many people have thought uh, that Jesus is going to come back to the earth and annihilate the earth. And that he is going to do away with government, he's going to do away with law, he's going to do away with business. They're thinking they haven't thought it through. 
But all of these arenas in life of human society, there is no indication prophetically that he's going to do away with these but instead that they will come under the reign and the rule of Jesus through the Holy Spirit under the kingdom of God. So we see that before Jesus returns, we can have a manifestation to some degree or another of the kingdom of God in each of these areas. This is accomplished as a foretaste, as a testimony, as a witness of the way life will be after Jesus returns. That's what it means to have a testimony of the kingdom of God now. So if we don't have, right now all we've done, all we've tried to do is put a testimony of the kingdom of God into the religious sphere of our churches. We haven't even dealt with social action and philosophy. Well, some people have tried to do social action and a little bit of counseling. But why are the people who have claim to have the God of creation within them, why are we using technology that has been invented by heathens instead of being the inventors? Why are we dancing to songs written by degenerates instead of writing the most beautiful creative music in the world? That's just a thought. We comprise today, today, right now, we comprise a vanguard force of forerunners, discovering, declaring, displaying, and demonstrating the gospel of the kingdom of God before a watching, skeptical, hostile, and even antagonistic world. Okay, let me say that again. In this room, those of you who are watching, those who are studying, we comprise a vanguard force of forerunners, discovering, declaring, displaying, and demonstrating the gospel of the kingdom of God before, in front of, and under the scrutiny of a watching, skeptical, hostile, and even antagonistic world. The devil has a right to say, show me. The world has a right to say, show me. Principalities and powers in heavenly places are watching the church to see the manifold wisdom of God that was hidden in Christ Jesus from before the beginning of time, that it's true. They have been given the right by God. We have the privilege of being the ones who declare, display, and demonstrate the kingdom in front of them. The gospel of the kingdom of God is a witness of the way life will be when Jesus returns. And he stands and he reigns upon the earth from Jerusalem. He will not be in New York City. He will not be in London. He will not be in Paris to rule. He may visit those places during the thousand years, but he will be ruling from the city of Jerusalem. It is for this very reason that we have been anointed and provided such an undeserved and unreserved favor and grace of God at this time in history. This is why I believe there is an exceptionally open heaven. There is an exceptional opportunity for great grace to be upon the church in this hour. We are his witnesses of his kingdom reign upon the earth as it is in heaven. One of the things I want to just point out, many people, when they talk about this, they speak of Jesus as the king and they speak about him being an absentee king. It's like he's not really here. It's like he's in heaven. He's an absentee king. And that he's just spun this whole thing and set us on our own. No, the king is in residence. The king is in residence within us, within the church. Christ in me is the hope of glory. He is not absent. He is not coming someday in a fuller measure. Yes, I got that, but there is a measure of his presence today. When we look at this, we must understand that first we need to see the kingdom of God. And then, and I, I remember the tent illustration I used a few weeks ago, and then we must believe the kingdom of God. 
we must receive the kingdom of God. And then we must enter the kingdom of God now in this life and after death. So I want to take a moment to look at the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 3. If somebody would read John, chapter 3, verse 3. Now, this is very famous. Nicodemus, one of the leaders among the Jewish leaders, came to Jesus at night. And he began to ask him some questions. And so the first one I want you to look at is John, Chapter 3, verse 3. Anybody? Loudly. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of John God. 3, 3. That's John 3, 3. Anybody else try a different John 3.3? 3. <laughs> I have Jesus replied with all earnest, earnestness I possess. I tell you this, unless you are born again, you can never get into the kingdom of God. Okay, John 3.3. 3. That's John 3.3. 3 Anybody else? Three. See, here's what mine says. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you are born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The entering of the kingdom of God is in verse 5. You didn't say see, you say enter. I think maybe so. John 3, 3, what does it say? And said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, see right away what we have done with that we have said we cannot see the kingdom of God after we die and go to heaven. But Jesus isn't speaking about seeing the kingdom of God after we die and go to heaven. He's talking about seeing the kingdom of God now. But unless you're given new eyes and a new heart and a new mind and a new way of thinking, unless you are born again. Now look at look, verse 5. Sorry about the confusion there. Now John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So again, we all get in this big argument whether we baptized this way or whether we did it that way or whether we got born again this way and everything else. And we miss the whole fact that what he's talking about is enter into the kingdom of God. Not after you die, but now. So first we must see the kingdom. We must see the kingdom and we must believe that it's real and we must receive it and then we must enter into it. This is what the Roman Catholic Church and the church of 1800 years has robbed from us. Because they've right away taken these things and they've said, oh, this is talking about going to heaven. But in the context of what Jesus is speaking about, he is not talking about going to heaven. It's clear from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that there's a reasonable expectation that we may and should be able to first see the kingdom of God. Secondly, that we would believe that there is a kingdom of God and that we would receive, like a little child, the kingdom of God. And third, having received it, then we enter into the kingdom of God now and into the future. It's a whole different way of thinking. So you have to change the way you're thinking. It's not about trying to make it to the end of the race die and go to heaven and enter into the kingdom of God. Listen, heaven is not a goal. Heaven is a destiny. Hell won't have you because of the blood of Jesus of Nazareth has disqualified you to go to hell. 
You can't go to hell because the blood of Jesus of Nazareth has disqualified you. They don't want you there. But heaven is a destiny, temporary though it may be, because God is going to bring heaven to earth and abide upon the earth at the end. You read the last chapter of the book. So we see that there is an incredible change in the way we think that has to occur. Now I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to read verses 5, 1 through 5. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, and they say, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, <laughs> This is an amazing question. I suppose we ask this question among ourselves today, don't we? The power of performance kicks in and says, unless you produce, you're of no value. And you judge your value on the basis of what you produce through your performance. And on and on and on. And religious, Roman, religi Roman Catholic guilt comes in play. And it makes you have to perform. Jump through hoops. But we discussed one time a few weeks ago, there's no such thing as a happy hoop hopper. We also discussed that the Father qualifies us. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus of Nazareth. Who is the greatest? This is a question of someone who does not yet understand the manner and the character of the kingdom of God. They're still looking at the kingdom after the matter of the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus called a little child to him. And he said, set him in the midst of them. And he said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted, converted, and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, Jesus says, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. So right, right off the bat, he's talking about the law of receptivity of the kingdom of God, which we talked about in Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 and 42. Jesus called a little child to himself in order to humble all those who exalt their education, their knowledge, and their experience as a criteria of greatness in the kingdom of God. See, these, are the, these are what we use. Education, money, reputation, experience, uh, all these sorts of things. That's, that qualifies you to be somebody great in the kingdom of God. What did Jesus say? If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, be the servant of all. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, be the slave. He said, I didn't come to serve or be served. I came to serve and give myself as a ransom. Unless you are converted and become, this is a very interesting, unless you are converted and become. Now, what that says, it indicates that there is both an expectation on God's part and an ability on man's part to do exactly this. Okay? Look at it. Unless you are converted and become as a little child. So you have an expectation. Expectation on God's side. God's expecting you to be converted. You were born into trespasses and sin. You, you were a slave to sin. You were a slave to ungodliness. Now you have to be born again and become the slave of God. I mean, you have to be converted from one kingdom into the other kingdom. And it says here there is also an ability to make that choice. And that's the side on man's side. Man has to make a choice. I choose. I choose your side, Lord. I choose to humble myself. Uh, 
Uh, take a moment with me and read. Uh, someone pick up John, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. John, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Anyone and loudly so the camera can pick you up. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. A new, new creature. A new creation. In Christ. He did not come to fix us. He came to replace us. He did not come to fix the old Adam. He came to bring a new culture, a new civilization, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And when we look at each other, we look, it says right there in verse 16, we once knew Christ after the flesh. I am so sad to say that the majority of Christianity still appraises one another after the flesh. For we do not perceive the Christ or the Christos, the life of God that's in the other person. We do not know what that person has in Christ as a new creature. So we see one another after the flesh and we receive one another after the courtesy of the flesh rather than after the spirit. We don't even ask ourselves or others, what is in that man? What's in, what is in that man? What is the reward in that man? What is he doing here? I think every pastor ought to ask the question, what are you, what are you doing here? Why did God send you? What part do you play? As we learn to receive one another after the Spirit of Christ within each of us, and not simply after the courtesy of the flesh, we shall begin to receive the gift of God which abides in each one of us. But as long as we continue to receive one another after the flesh, we fail to receive the gift of God that is in each one of us. Humility and honor will become a healing characteristic of our intentional kingdom, community, lifestyle, and culture as we embrace the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now I want to take a moment to look at some of the characteristics and qualities of becoming like a little child. Characteristics, qual characteristic qualities of becoming as little children. The first one, and these are in no particular order, these are just my own observations and uh, investigation. So, first off, I find that children are delightfully curious and inquisitive. A child that's three years old, two years old, you don't have to teach them to be curious. You don't have to teach them not to try to look into things. They're always getting into places they shouldn't be. That's why you put them in a playpen. Because they're curious what those pots and pans are under the sink. They want to know what is that laundry soap taste like. They're not supposed to, but they're curious. What? The dog's bowl. What is that dog eating? They are curious. They are inquisitive. Are we? Are we curious and inquisitive in regards to the things of God and the kingdom of God? Am I investigating? Am I looking into that? Okay, they have a capacity to learn new things. I tell you, children, <laughs> some of the questions, how, why? You know, 
questions that two and three year olds ask for and they're famous. Why, 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 why? When, when, when? Where, where, where? They'll ask these questions. As soon as their language, you have the language, they'll start to ask these questions. They're curious and they're inquisitive and they want to learn new things. Children are naturally capable of being taught new things. I was incredibly, uh, when I um, began uh, working with uh, Vietnamese, I began working with uh, Vietnamese people in Tacoma, Washington, and a uh, Korean, and I tried to learn the language. But my tongue was so old and dry, my accent was terrible. And as I was doing this, I was told that prior to puberty, prior to puberty, that a child can learn five, six, seven languages without an accent. And then at puberty, something locks. And from that point on, they pick up, they can still learn languages, but then they will have an accent. So for a period up until puberty, I'm able to study an incredible amount. We limit our children by not giving them more than what they think. They, we give them these very tiny little bite pieces, and that's why some kids are so bored with public school. They're so bored because they, can, they have a capacity for so much more. They have a capacity to learn new things, and we limit them in part because we don't want to get that engaged or involved. Children possess unbridled sense of wonder and amazement. I, the look in a child's eye. You ever looked in a child's eye the first time they saw a clown at the circus? Or the first time they ever thought about coming up and touching um, a large dog or a, a getting on a horse? Something. I mean, they're just, uh, eyes are like, wow. They have a wow factor of wonder in them. What about us? Do I wonder at God? Am I filled with the awe of God? Does God fill me with awe and wonder? Does his kingdom present the awe and wonder of God? My goodness, God, what have you given to me? I tell you, I wish we had more wonder and more awe, amazement in our lives towards God and his, his word. Then they receive instruction without needing understanding. Understanding. I am so tired as I deal with adults. They won't take instruction until they understand. They won't do what they're told until they understand why they're doing it. Hello? See, children don't need to understand. They will just simply obey when they are instructed to do something without a need of understanding. In part, because of humility, they know they don't understand things. So the idea of trying to understand isn't, it isn't a requirement. So they're able to receive instruction without needing to understand. There is a purity of innocence that is disarming. I'm telling you what, you walk up to a little two-year-old or two-and-a-half, three-year-old child, a small infant, at sitting in, uh, in Walmart or in some grocery store, and they're sitting there and they're looking at some candy and stuff, and mommy's saying, no, you can't have that. But then you're walking by and they look up at you and they see you're a grandpa, and they know full well that you're a soft touch. And they give you that look. You ever seen that look, that little boy look? He looks up at you and says, oh, won't you do that? And I want to reach over. But I've heard mommy say no, so I won't do it. But I want to. I want to help this boy. Because <laughs> there is such a purity in his eyes and such an innocence. And I'm just going, man, I'm melting. I'm melting right there in the aisle. We've all experienced that. We've all experienced that smell of a new baby. That new baby smell. There's a purity and an innocence there. What about me? Am I walking? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I'm not a pure in heart because I've 
I haven't sinned. I'm pure in heart because I've been made pure by the blood of Jesus of Nazareth. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord but him with clean hands and a pure heart? But my hands are not clean, Lord, because I haven't done wrong. My heart is not pure, Lord, because I haven't, I haven't done anything. My hands are clean and my heart is pure because the blood of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of God, the Lamb of God, has washed me. I am qualified because of the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, the accuser of the brethren is cast down. He has no more to say. There is a purity and innocence that's disarming. Disarming to people, disarming to the enemy. I would to God that we had more purity and innocence. Little children are able to receive without suspicion of motive for giving them a gift. I would to God that people, that Christian disciples could receive the gifts of God without a suspicion in the motive of why people, why God's giving it to them. Oh, don't give me that. I might be called to go to Africa. Oh, don't give me that. I might have to do this. I don't want that gift. Why are you giving me this gift? Why are you giving me that? We, have, we cannot receive the gifts of God without a sense of suspicion of motive. What's your motivation? We need to be able to receive the kingdom of God for His great namesake. To bring Him pleasure for His great namesake. That's my motive. That's my purpose. Now, I don't know if you understand, but this in children, in infants, there is a lack of guarding oneself or a lack of self-defense. They are trusting until they have been taught by experience not to trust. Children, infants, are not naturally self-defensive. They're not ten they don't tend to do this and guard themselves or scream or hide until they have been beat, until they have been slapped, until they have been yelled at, until some sibling or some parent or some other force has come in and, and perverted that little tiny heart. But by themselves, they had no... They, had, they lacked a sense of guarding themselves. They didn't have a sense of self-defense. What about us when I come to God? Can I come to God without any guarding? Can I come to my brother? Can I come to the church without guarding myself? Or am I always wrapping myself up in some adornment so that you see me a certain way? You see something the right way? There's usually, at least in the early years, a lack of sense of entitlement. Children, now, don't get me wrong. When a baby is hungry, it will cry. When a baby is dirty, it will cry. When a baby is wet, when a baby is uncomfortable, don't get me wrong. But as a child grows two, three years old, two and a half, or whatever, they don't necessarily have a sense of entitlement until they have been taught entitlement by those who are older. Older siblings and parents impart entitlement into the soul of a child. The child is not born with a sense of entitlement. There is a simplicity of faith resident within children. Their faith is not complicated. They're not complicated. They're, not, they're simple. Simple. You tell them the, bu the, the, the bug, the worm, becomes a butterfly. The butterfly lays eggs. The eggs become a worm. The worm becomes a butterfly. Gotcha. I understand it. They'll, that's it. That, that's so simple. I got that. I see that. I can watch that. And you can see that happen. There's a simplicity. They don't need to know all the details. And we sometimes need to have a simplicity of faith when we come to the Word of God. God's Word says it. I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to walk in it. I don't necessarily have to understand it to obey. And I'm not so smart as to be able to uh, dissect this whole thing. There is a lack of self-awareness, resident, and fear. 
There is a lack of self-awareness and fear. This is similar to the guarding oneself and self-defense. But self-awareness usually begins to come into the life, creep into the life as they approach puberty. Until that time, a, a child that's eight, even nine years old, lacks generally a sense of self-awareness. They're not, it's not all about me. Now you can teach them to take the selfie and how important that is to you, but they themselves are not necessarily all about taking a selfie. And it's not all about me getting all the presents and me getting all the attention. There is a lack of concern, in general, of what others think of them. Until, of course, they have been wounded by what others think of them. See, we teach them. We teach them things like, shame on you. What do you want those people to think of you? You're going to go out there without any shoes? Your socks don't match. Oh my goodness, what do you think people are going to think of you or think of me? We lay these layers, these, these triggers on our children from the time they're infants and God says no, no, no. And He wants to bring healing into our lives into each and every one of these areas. There is a process by which a disciple may choose to humble himself and be converted to be or regenerated from the realm of narcissistic entitlement and self-determination to another of humility and reliance upon the words of our Father God like a little child. Luke 18, 24 to 27. There's a story. There's a story about a rich young ruler. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, I want to begin right here about Jesus and how he related to this rich young ruler. And this rich young ruler, if you remember the story, said, What must I do? to earn eternal life. And so we are going to deal with that issue and we're going to come back in about 10 minutes and we're going to continue with the second part of 13b. I'm sorry, I thought I would get through this whole thing in, a, in 40 minutes and I can't. And there's too much left. So I would rather come back in a few minutes, and then go through this. So important for us to understand. Because if we cannot learn how to receive the kingdom, we will never enter into the kingdom. Now. So, we're going to take a break. Thank you for your time. We're going to begin back up in 10 minutes. The Lord bless you. And be right back with us in just a few minutes. Thank you. Amen.